Hello all. This is the first in a follow-up series I hope to do after all of my main videos in which I include uh, points, aspects, information on sources which I forgot to include in the main videos and can talk about here as well as questions you may have in the comments or other general points on it. Um, these will be less a lot less structured than in the main videos, more informal, a bit more conversational. And I am open to names for this segment. So let's just begin. This one is a follow-up to my Car Katai series, which I will link to below. And I recommend watching before this because I'm not going to spend any time explaining what it is I'm talking about, just talking about it. Um, first off, the name. Kara Katai is off, was long thought to mean something, or long thought to mean black Kitans. Kara meaning black in Turkic and Mongolian languages. Um, more recent suggestions have it though on the the directional association with the color black. In Turkic and Mongolian, for those of you who don't know, uh, the directions north, south, east, west have color associations. So white, ak is east, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Kirk, blue is west, and kara, black, is north, and I can't remember what south is right now. Um, so black ketan, kar ketai, it's thought to mean more like uh, North or Great Ketons rather than Black Ketons, which would align with the Chinese uh, naming conventions for Kar Kitai. Kar Kitai is in Chinese, or in the Chinese sources rather, known as Shi Lao, uh, Western Lao, being the Western successor state to the Ketan Lao dynasty, which collapsed under the Jurchen onslaught in the early 12th century. Um, and also on Kitai, just for those of you curious or might not know, is also one of the potential origins for the word China or the word the China equivalents in a lot of uh, European languages. Uh, from Kitai, you get Kitai or Cathay in English. Uh, I believe in Russian, Kitai is still the word for China. Um, although there's lots of other debate for the potential origin of China, specifically in English, going back to uh, the first emperor, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. But anyways, uh, interestingly, the Karakatai are a recognized Chinese dynasty in the sources. Um, the only one to not actually be in China proper. Um, although the Chinese sources are generally not interested with the Kar Katai beyond Ye Lu Dashi's flight outside of Mongolia. Um, and this is, we get to another problem with the Kar Katai. We don't have any or any substantial sources from within the Kar Katai themselves. Rather, our Chinese sources are, like I said, interested up to the uh, flight of Ye Lu Dashi or a little bit on the uh, destruction of the Khanite under uh, Hu Chulug and uh, Ziv Noyan in 1217. Or our Muslim sources, which are talk almost exclusively about a little bit on the Battle of Katvan in 1143, or the final years of the dynasty with the conflict between Takesh Khwarezm Shah, Muhammad Khwarezm Shah, and Gurhan Jilagu, and of course Huchlug and all that fun stuff. Um, another interesting part of this, um, that our Persian sources don't have very, very much information on the car, the inside uh, nature of the Karakatai, is that the Karakatai continued the Chinese practice of just referring to the ruler by their title. So in China, the emperor would be referred to only as the emperor within his lifetime or after his ascension as emperor until his death. And then they get reign titles, temple names and stuff to differentiate, differentiate them from other emperors. But you don't use the emperor's personal name. Personal name. And the Karakatai seem to have continued this, um, referring to their rulers just as the Gurhan. Uh, Gurhan, of course, meaning so 
sort of universal ruler, emperor, uh, universal Khan. And part of this, well, they did actually get liked in the Chinese fashion, uh, reign names, temple names and stuff. But this seems to have confused the Muslim sort, the Muslims quite a, the Islamic writers quite a bit, as in their fashion, the ruler was their title name. So Shah Muhammad, or Muhammad Shah, uh, Shah Takish, and so on and so on. So which led, and I can't remember which writer this was, but a couple of them to believe that uh, it was just one Gurhan ruling from 1143 all the way until uh, 1200, 1211, as they were only ever just called the Gurhan. Now, the Karakatai also had two female rulers. And I got a question on one of these platforms was, uh, well, how did, the, how did the Muslims react to there being uh, female rulers? Because there is, to my knowledge, I believe, only one medieval uh, Islamic queen like who ruled in her own right and that was one of the delhi sultans whose name i can't remember right now ruling like 1230s 1240s thereabouts um when she was ruling not as regent not in place of her husband but actually as a successor to her father um and the karakatai likewise had two uh, female rulers, although one of or Yeludashi's widow and uh, one of his daughters, although his widow may have just ruled as regent for her son, because once he came of age, she disappears. Um, now, the great likelihood, due to the Karakatai custom of just referring to the ruler as Gurhan, is that most of the Muslim citizens, since the vast majority of the Karakatai's population were Muslims, didn't realize that they had a female ruler because she was still just referred to as the Gurhan. Um, what would have been a bigger issue would be the fact that they were all infidels. The Kitans, the ruling Kitans, were all Buddhists or, well, not Muslims. Uh, Dennis Sinor, Sinor? I don't know how you say his name. He's a historian and I was reading an article by him last night. And he was saying uh, part of the mitigating factor against the Karakatai rulers having to convert to Islam was the prestige they enjoy due to, to, due to their associations with China. And China and the Lao dynasty carried enough prestige among the Turco-nomadic population and the urban sedentary Islamic population within their realms that the Khitans alongside relatively uh, light uh, administrative and bureaucratic presence, just pay your taxes and we'll leave you alone, sort of combining to let the Khitans uh, get away with still being Khitans and did not assimilate in the way that we saw with, or adopt at least, that we, would see, that we later see with Mongols in the Ilkhanite, Chagatai Khanite, and Golden Horde with... Uh, Turkic Islamic features or Mongols in the Yuan dynasty where some Chinese uh, aspects and customs would be adopted, although in smaller amounts. And it is possibly, perhaps due to this light bureaucratic presence, um, as well as letting their, rather than rule directly, allowed their vassals to stay same place, such as the Khwarezm Shahs and the Karakhanids. So rather than being ruled themselves, or ruling directly, that it was the Karakatai, and then, say, the uh, Khwarezm Shah. So now we don't have now sources from Karakatai officials, we have sources from Khwarezmians. And it's perhaps because of this that we have very little uh, on the internal structure of the Karakatai. So a lot of very fascinating questions we might have on their, you know, how they structured, how their relations with, say, the Tangut and the Jin dynasty or other neighboring states. We are unable to answer that because 
we just have no inward looking sources. Uh, we do have a little bit of sort of inter inferences we can make, but like I believe I mentioned in part two, my car Katai part two, was there was some evidence for a potential uh, car Katai military uh, uh, operation against the Jin as late as the 1180s, but it was so substantial we can't say whether it actually happened, if it was just a scouting party or as I believe Dr. Biron suggested, sort of a more for show to go, oh, see, we're still carrying this, the dream, the reason for the Karakatai alive, which was uh, restoring the Lao Dynasty, which uh, Ye Ludashi likely hoped it originally intended to do so, but was quickly became impossible. The Jin Dynasty was far too strong, and it's I think it is underappreciated just how powerful the Jin Dynasty uh, was, actually. Have an immense military, immense economic might. Um, the fact the Mongols had such a relatively easy, it was still a 30-year war, but relatively easy time fighting against the Jin was that in the early 13th century they had just everything went wrong. Poor emperors, ecological conditions went bad, yellow Yellow River completely changed its course. Uh, huge economic problems were with the Song Dynasty. But that's not what we're talking about here. Well, see, we can discuss those issues because we have that sort of information from uh, the Jin or detailed enough information from the Mongols and the Yuan Dynasty or the Song. We don't have that for the Kaur Uh There is... Dr. Biran has found some circumstantial evidence for Khitans being present in Central Asia before Yelu Dashi's arrival, um, serving as mercenaries, for example, in the service of the Karakhanids, who then joined Yelu Dashi. Um, and perhaps some small Khitan migration west from Manchuria to, from Manchuria, from China to uh, the Karakatai realm, which wouldn't be a terribly far trip as the Karakatai came to, their borders came to Western Mongolia and the Tangut Kingdom. So for a Khitan and his horse, not a hugely distant trip, but uh, Yelu Dashi himself seems to have traveled with maybe 10 to 20,000 Khitans in his initial, uh, initial, uh, movement to Western Asia, to Central Asia, which is perhaps part of why the Khitan administration was so light-handed. There just were never a lot of Khitans within Kar Khitai. How ironic. Um, what else? One interesting point of comparison is that as the Kar Khitai realm was collapsing under you know, Huchluk, Shah Muhammad, and then Ziv's invasion in 1217. The Mongols were in China propping up a puppet Lao Khitan state. Uh, a significant amount of Khitans remained in China after the fall of the Lao dynasty and took on important positions making in the Jin military, uh, making up a good percentage of the military. Um, the Jurchen, much like the Khitan in uh, the Karakatai were very not terribly numerous, not related ethnically to the Khitans or the Mongols or the Han Chinese. Um, the Jurchen only made up, I think it was about 3% of the population of the Jin dynasty, um, but then alongside the Khitans made up most of the military in the form of their powerful cavalry, and very heavy, heavy cavalry they were famous for. And the Khitans and Han Chinese, however, were restricted from taking any sort of important position within the civil administration or the military until very late in the dynasty. So we actually see Khitans defecting to Chinggis Khan as early as the 1190s, um, and then turning this trickle of defection turn into a flood as soon as the Mongols invaded the Jin Empire proper in 1211. Betraying Jurchen units, 
handing over important information. Um, and this became an aspect of uh, Chinggis's sort of propaganda against the Jin, justification for the war, is that seeing this strong, strong Kitan hatred for the Jin, uh, they helped support uh, a Kitan independence movement in Manchuria and the foundation of a new Lao kingdom. And Chinggis's propaganda was that the Mongols were attacking the Jin as revenge for the murder of his uh, relative on Bahai, and now acting as uh, liberators of the Kitans, restoring the rule of the Lao against these usurpers. Um, and so while this Lao, new Lao kingdom was being established, the other Lao successor state was collapsing and would be absorbed by the Mongols, of course, in 1218. Um, the Lao puppet state and another uh, sort of vassal puppet state, uh, the kingdom of Ta Chen, both in Manchuria, continued on until the early 1230s when the Mongols uh, absorbed them in preparation for an invasion of Korea. Um, further, I always encourage you to do your own, do further research if you're interested in the things I talk about. There is a great limit on what I can include in even a 10, or as this is going on to be 17, 20 minutes long video. So if you are very interested in this topic, I always include uh, the sources I've used in the descriptions of my videos or links to primary sources if I can find them online. And if you're curious about, if you want to do further reading, you know, feel free to ask in the comments. For this, I would highly recommend, if you can find it, Dr. Biron's The Empire of Karakatai in Eurasian History, perhaps the single best source in English for all facets of the Karakatai, origins, course, collapse, and what we do know about the internal structure, and for my videos was one of my main sources. I will also, in the description, link to a site which has PDFs to some of her other works online, as well as includes links to Amazon and things like that, where you can buy her, uh, order her Empire of Karakatai and whatnot. Um, I will also link below to a translation of Juvaini. Uh, Juvaini was one of our main uh, Persian historians from the 13th century, who provides us a great amount of information on the final years of the Karakatai, Huchluk in particular. Uh, and I use some of his work and quotes in my uh, final video on the Karakatai here. Um, and I may do another video on them as well, looking at sort of the influence on Mongol administration and stuff in Central Asia. As I mentioned in the last one, there was a Dawagachi present in Amalik in, by, as early as 1221. And Kitans... Certainly, Kitans from China took on important roles in the early Mongol administration, famous ones including Yelu Ahai, uh, Yelu Tuchai, and, and others. Um, so this has been a test. As you can see, it's a little rough. The timer is currently at 90 minutes. This is far too long, simply unacceptable. Um, let me know what kind of follow-up stuff you would like to see in future ones of these, if or if you thought this was just a complete waste of time and I should not even have bothered the hour I've spent preparing this. Um, I'm also beginning work on my next video, looking at the massacre of Uchar and the origins of the Mongol invasion of the Khwarezmian Empire, which will be a real exciting piece of work. From there, we will look at the Mongol invasion of the Khwarezmian Empire, excursions of... Uh, Subutai, Ziv into southern Russia, uh, and of course Chinggis Khan's final campaign against uh, Tamglut. And then I really, what I really want to do is a bit more stuff on the early uh, administration of the Mongol Empire and a bit more of that uh, analysis, form and function rather than just narrative as we have done so far. But the rate I'm going, we'll be talking about this in six months.
So, auf Wiedersehen.